Hey, hello guys, welcome to the second video of the week number 9. Uh, well, we already discussed some of the most general um, components, characteristics, features of the Romantic period. Um, so here we're going to explore uh, something a little bit about the themes. Uh, what were the stories about? What were the poems about? Uh, what were the, the novels, etc. about, right? In Romanticism. So there are some uh, topics that are persistent, that are uh, somehow um, all the time there, that are repeating throughout different iterations, different versions. Um, in most of the cases, we're going to see them um, present, right? So, uh, if we go to the slide 111, we will see a couple of those, yes? Uh, so, first of all, was libertarianism, right? Um, and this is sort of a, a child, a son of, of the previous period, because remember that in the previous period, um, there was a lot of um, concern uh, for uh, the... Um, human being being uh, equal, let's say we were all created equal and we were all somehow uh, have the same rights and we have the same, uh, I, well not the same ideas but the same possibilities of telling ideas etc. right? So that was what happened in, in neoclassical. So this libertarianism, yes, um, went a little bit uh, beyond, yes, because um, this sort of uh, preached uh, the desire to be free of convention, yes, okay, sure, we are equal to each other and we sort of uh, have the same rights, but everyone can explore that in different ways, depending of our personality, of our desires, uh, like we can be free in our own personal way, we can be free of that convention. Yes, that is why uh, this is in consonance uh, with the, the values of, of uh, having the possibility of, of uh, get away from rules or for certain conventions and things like that. So as long as you're not provoking, uh, let's say, uh, any harm to, to your uh, neighbor, uh, well, you're going to be able to, to be free. That is what uh, the romantic theme proposes. And, um, well, of course, we're talking about also uh, political tyranny, yes, uh, let's say foreign countries trying to oppress you, foreign countries trying to tell you what to do, uh, for, um, institutions such as church, uh, such as the police, institutions such as, uh, I don't know, the sanitarium, institutions such as the jail, right? Uh, so they were trying to get away a little bit from this because they found it uh, too oppressive. Um, and of course, well, there was an emphasis on, on the dignity of the individual. No matter how different you are, you are supposed to be respected. Um, we're going to see that uh, a lot of political and social issues are, are presented in romantic uh, novels, tales, etc because there is like an exposure somehow uh, of, of the problems to the people by means of, uh, of these literary works. Uh, we will see that this trend starts over here in Romanticism and it will reach its probably most important uh, peak on the Victorian period. Well, we will talk about it later. Now, um, there was also uh, a really important um, a really important uh, emphasis on nature. Uh, we come to a society that is somehow civilized, that is urban, yes, uh, that uh, has its centers uh, on the city, uh, in the polis somehow. Um, but uh, we want to return to nature, and here we go one more time to the nostalgia thing. Remember that I mentioned all the time that nostalgia is one of the most uh, like powerful forces, well, you were seeing it period after period that we always return to something that was uh, precious before, right? So, um, let's say that there's like a, a, a um, an appreciation of nature, of forests, of rivers, 
of uh, animals, of nature in general, right? And how these are uh, more relaxing, uh, more beneficial, uh, more authentic, uh, more benevolent than the sea. Yes, we're always like sort of uh, um, establishing those parallels uh, or simply by opposition. We make the, the sea more horrible, right? So we can sort of, in the stories I mean, we make the city more horrible, with more terrible conditions, with uh, people are worse somehow, and um, by opposition we understand that nature is uh, better, right? Um, there is delight, yes, because you see this is there is no, no joy but delight, that is an extreme uh, degree of pleasure, right? Delight in unspoiled scenery, yes. What is unspoiled scenery? Like this scenery, landscapes. Uh, forests, fields, uh, small towns and villages that have not been yet corrupted by the hand of the civilized man. Uh, so we see a lot of this in, in some of the romantic sceneries. And uh, the presumably innocent life of the rural dwellers, right? Like people who live in the, in the, in the fields, in the countryside, people like farmers, um, let's say we can call simple people, uh, have better values, are more honest, are friendlier, are um, sometimes even smarter uh, than people who inhabit uh, the sea, right? So this, this uh, sort of um, attraction towards the, the countryside or, or let's say rural areas are, are something important, right? Now, if we go to the next slide, you will see something that is really important. It says, the lure of the exotic. Yeah? Well, think about something that comes to your mind when I say exotic. Yes? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? So, I don't know. For some people, it might be uh, food. You know, like exotic food. Something that I don't eat very much in my, in my own... Um, place in my own country but uh, something that they eat somewhere else that seems strange to me delicious things such as uh, fruit that uh, seems to be really different from us or food let's say a cook, cook that is really different from us or uh, the other side no let's say exotic maybe eating grasshoppers or eating rats or snakes or uh, dogs right that may be exotic and disgusting for, for many of you, right? Um, now, some other people may think about places, yes? Uh, an island, somewhere else that you don't know, right? Um, so that may be exotic. So some among you may think about exotic dancers, I don't know. Uh, Half-naked girls or guys uh, dancing this uh, really uh, erotic um, dances or movements or doing these sort of things, right? But I bet that most of you like cannot really uh, pinpoint, locate something that is exotic for you. Like I don't know, I have listened to the word but no idea what is exotic. And that has a lot to do with our way of life. Internet has helped us reach the remotest places on earth, has helped us uh, discover the more secretive rituals, the more secretive behaviors, the strangest things that we have seen in, in let's say, in life, right? So nowadays it's actually really difficult to find something that surprises you, yes? So you have seen on the internet terrible crimes, horrible deaths, very impressive art, really amazing architecture, uh, really strange languages, practices, uh, rituals, celebrations, festivals, carnivals, uh, people dying, accidents, tortures, uh, depraved practices, yes, uh, such as the ones that, that are so popular supposedly on the deep web, uh, in, in, in moral trade, in moral, uh, let's say, negotiations, yes, in which you can pay somebody to kill somebody else, in which you can find people who be who offer themselves to be eaten somehow for cannibal as well. So all this uh, wonderful and terrible list that I make to you, it's just to let you know that it's really difficult 
nowadays to find something that surprises you, right? Well, back then, it was much easier, right, uh, to find something that was uh, amazing, fantastic, that was uh, attracting, that was completely new, yes? Remember that not many years ago, uh, barely a uh, hundred or two hundred years ago, a complete new continent was discovered. There was uh, North America, right? Well, discovered. Um, and, well, people, their practices in their animals, food, uh, rituals, behaviors, uh, you name it. Yes, everything was new and everything was fantastic and you wanted to know everything about it. Yes, it is like if we tomorrow discover a new planet and, and we discover that, uh, let's say, there were people or living beings uh, living there for a hundred or two hundred years, right? So we would like to know anything about them and anything by the slightest, yes, the way they the thing that they have from, from breakfast until their entertainment and the movies they watch, they will be completely fascinating for us because it will be completely new, right? So uh, people in Romanticism, they had more or less this one, right? So um, they were really fascinated by the exotic, yes? And this exotic comprise, as I mentioned, anything you name it, from food uh, to uh, rituals, of fertility, of harvesting, rituals of praising different gods, uh, reaching the black continent of Africa, um, the uh, interactions and the languages of the natives, um, the sexual practices was something that was really exotic. Um, let's say finding this, this uh, aborigines or uh, indigenous people who uh, uh, for example, girls who were bare-breasted, like they, they didn't have tops. Uh, that was really, really a, a new thing and a fascinating thing and a, a, a stimulating thing, yes? Thinking about, uh, the, um, let's say, intermingling of, of races, yes? Uh, how uh, um, the sexual relationships were possible, I mean, that seems silly to think but back then it was a big deal right uh, between a black person and a white person or, or indigenous people and how how these uh, combinations and racial combinations and racial mixing um, was uh, somehow attractive right um, nowadays that may seem offensive right probably back then it was offensive as well but well it was something new and and, and it was surprising and it was uh, a big, a big um, source of curiosity and source of exploration, right? Um, so that exotic theme was really, really there, and we can see it into a lot of different, um, a lot of different uh, stories that take place into unknown lands, distant countries, um, with. Um, people that were not necessarily similar to them and animals who were exotic and food that was exotic and everything else, right? Um, and then we have uh, the final one that is the supernatural, right? This is really, really interesting, yes? Because in the previous, in the previous uh, period um, we saw how everything was very rational and logical and science supported, right? So remember that one of the uh, big uh, features of this period was imagination, right? So what if we go a little bit beyond the logic and what if we go a little bit beyond science and what if we just uh, ignore that just for purposes of entertainment or for purposes of wondering about the human condition, um, about any other things, right? Um, so the supernatural was a big thing over there, right? So we have tons of stories about ghosts, about monsters, werewolves, vampires, uh, somehow uh, possessions, devils, demons, etc., right? So all of that is romantic, guys, yeah? We can say that uh, Dracula is romantic, somehow, uh, until this point, it is more Victorian than romantic, but let's say that we have all these different things. And definitely we have uh, the stories of Edgar Allan Poe that are really famous for being uh, full of what? 
well, madness and depression and killings and anger and what? Uh, well, all these uh, exacerbated feelings. Yes, makes complete sense. Completely feels into it. Yes, uh, he's, let's say, one of the parents of uh, Gothic Romanticism, but uh, nevertheless is more romantic than anything else. Yes, you see, it, it completely fits with, uh, with this um, description that I gave you at the beginning, exacerbation of feelings. Characters who were demented, who were obsessed, who were crazy, who did not control uh, the own impulses, right? Uh, so we have all these supernatural things, all these supernatural components uh, over here in the um, romantic, uh, romantic period, right? Um, let's say that uh, we have mentioned all of these. Uh, let me go back a little bit. We have mentioned libertar libertarianism. This uh, drive towards nature, the delight for, for natural scenery, the exotic, the supernatural, right? It doesn't mean, guys, that uh, necessarily all these stories had to have everything, right? Some of them do. Um, some of them do. But in general, they had one or two of these components and they developed that, right? So, for example, if we talk about Alan Poe, there's a lot of... Uh, supernatural things sometimes in there but they are mostly urban yes they are not very rural and sometimes they just deal with the exacerbation of stories without getting into um, the supernatural yeah if you take a look at many of the most important ones uh, I don't know the Telltale Heart, the Black Cat um, maybe the Raven yes none of them have a real ghost none of them have a real demon if you take a look at the 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 murders of the room uh, well the assassin in there it is an ape it is an uh, spoiler alert sorry <laughs> it is an ape it's an, uh, an, an orangutan right not really like a monster or something like that but um, you see things are taken here and there uh, in order to, uh, to develop this uh, sort of, of different things, right? Um, so, um, we're going to leave it like that for, for, for this moment. Uh, there's like another part uh, that, uh, that deals with uh, the um, American, when I say American, the United States version of uh, Romanticism. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the important works. But I think we're going to do that uh, next week, okay? So, um, I'm going to leave the video over here right now. I'm going to tell you about the assignment in a minute. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about the evaluation, okay? But for now, this is uh, Romanticism for this uh, week, okay? So please, start it now. Start using the word Romanticism properly. Stop saying romanticizing, romanticizing or romanticizing without thinking. There's a particular way to say it and think twice before you call somebody a romantic. Okay? Thanks a lot and uh, see you in the next video. Bye bye. Hugs.